This forest road is one of my favorites. Nice and wide, not too bad after the first mile or so, and a pretty drive. It's still a dirt road and feels infinitely long, but it's a joy compared to many. This is the one infamous bad section, the water crossing. You're right, no water today, but it can be quite bad early in the season. The dirt section took us about 30 minutes. The other thing I love about this one is the generous amount of parking. This is my second time on this first bit of trail, and it serves as a long but lovely flattish warm up before you start climbing. There are several beautiful campsites a couple miles in on the lake, and I have photos of a few on the map linked below. Being at low elevation, it does tend to be significantly hotter down here than up in the mountains. That wasn't a problem on this trip, but on our return from Tuck and Robin, it was brutally hot, giving me the perfect excuse to take a brief dip in the lake. I'm not sure at this elevation it counts as an alpine lake, but this is the first wild lake in Washington I've been in. As a kid, I used to be one of the first ones to jump in the river and stay in until my lips turned blue, but whatever powers I had seemed to be long gone. I'm a big fan of short, scalding hot showers now, and my husband affectionately calls me lobster. But I think I enjoy it a bit more than they do. At the end of the lake, you will say goodbye to the water for a bit, and the trail quickly transitions from flat to straight up. After about 500 feet of climbing, you will pass the split to go east to Tuck and Robin Lakes, which is equally beautiful, but an even more difficult hike than this one, especially the full pack. Another 500 feet up, and you'll reach Deception Pass where the trail crosses the Deception Creek Trail and the PCT, which you could take north towards Trap Lake or south to Cathedral Pass. I'm not sure where Deception Pass gets its name, but we felt like it was because after all that climbing, you immediately drop down the far side, losing almost all the ele elevation you just gained, and start over again, though the climb is a bit milder this time. Of all the creatures we thought we might encounter on this trail, these were not on our list. These ones are part of a llama tour, which I didn't know was a thing until this trip. Another oddity that we haven't crossed paths with yet are pack goats, but we have met two different people who own and backpack with them. We were expecting a rough climb up to Jade, and we got that, but we weren't expecting the traverse around Marmot to be where the fun started. As soon as we hit the lake, the well-maintained trail turned into more of a goat path. It wasn't difficult, but it was narrow and crumbly, making for slow going with pack. Once you hit the far side, the final climb starts. The climb was mostly a series of colorful boulder fields, with lots of huge steps. Some of it felt like picking our way up the chute of a giant ball dispenser. I've seen people refer to this section as a scramble, but with poles, we never had to use our hands. There was a fairly well-established path, at least late in the season, but it was often easier to see from above than below. The majority of the rocks were pretty solid, and there wasn't much small scree, but there were surprises every now and then. This avalanche chute was probably the most unstable so watch out if there are people above or below you. The transition from boulder field to dirt trail is pretty sudden, and once you reach it, you are done. There's a little more walking to go, but the hard part is over, so relax and enjoy the stunning scenery. On your way, you'll pass this beauty. It is No Name Lake, and in my opinion, greatly underrated. There are a couple semi-secluded campsites near it. We arrived on a Friday afternoon on the last nice weekend of the season, and were pretty nervous about whether we would find a spot at Jade. So I staked out one here while someone else went ahead to check out the options. We were shocked and delighted to find a prime spot still available, and this was our view. And the night sky view wasn't bad either. Earlier this summer, there was a meteor shower. That week, this place was packed, and people were struggling to find campsites anywhere. Jade is popular enough that there are often no spots available in the summer, so plan carefully. The vegetation here is beautiful and very delicate so please protect it by walking on the trails and camping on official sites. In the morning, we woke to another beautiful day and set our sights on a new target, Tip Top Gap and Pea Soup Lake. Our first big challenge was getting down to the tip of the lake. This down climb was quite loose and right on the edge of my comfort zone. Luckily for me, getting back up felt like no problem. Some people take advantage of the low water level and lack of vegetation to camp down over here, and it adds a lot of spots, but it isn't a climb I think I would be comfortable doing with all my gear. Once we got past that bit, it was smooth sailing for a while. We gradually picked our way up towards the glacier. Without the glacier flower filtering down through the canyon, coming from centuries of ice grinding up the rocks, Jade would still be beautiful, but it would just be another lake. The mineral suspended in the water absorbs some wavelengths of light while reflecting others, and in many cases, the result is stunning. If you get close to the water at Jade, you can see that it has an almost milky quality and very little visibility. 
As we approached the foot of the glacier, we occasionally saw rocks tumble down on the left side. It was interesting how different the two sides of the canyon were, with one side appearing to be a solid rock fortress, while the other was a mix of scree rock and ice. According to almost everything I've read, this glacier was supposed to be just a snowfield that you could walk up the middle of, with or sometimes even without specks. Well, I'm sure it usually looks like a snowfield, but this year the extreme melt has revealed it to in fact be a true glacier, and it has potential to be a dangerous one. We were the first group to reach the glacier today. We scrambled over and around the first section, and that is where we chose to stop. Some other people quickly caught up with us, and we all assessed the next section together. Shared challenges and uncertainty in the mountains seems to bring people together, and works as a nice social lubricant. A few people attempted to climb, while a small growing group of spectators gathered on the rocks and swapped stories. The amount of melt cut our trip up to Pea Soup short, but gave us the opportunity to see the beauty of this glacier in a way most people don't get to. It was also a firm reminder of how hazardous they can be, even when they look benign. From the edge, the middle of this one looked pretty solid, but from down in the crevasse, I could see that it was completely hollow underneath, and there was light filtering through in a couple of spots. Splendor and danger in a complex package. For every crevasse you see, there are probably more hiding below the surface. As far as we know, no one made it up to the lake at the top today, and we heard one chilling story from a couple who tried to go up the right side and had a bit of the glacier give way below them. I felt that coming here for the views and the experience is still well worth it. But if you're looking for something a little more chill, there is also a nice short hike up to a lookout on the left side of the lake. Instead of going down the loose slope, you take the steps up instead. Back at the lake, completely by chance, we ran into some old friends and spent a relaxing afternoon catching up and enjoying the incredible setting. A few people were brave enough to take a dip in the icy, opaque waters, but I could barely stand up on my feet in for very long. After the light faded, we bundled up on a rock to look for shooting stars. We didn't catch any, but we did see a string of lights tinkle across the sky. This was our second time backpacking to see a recent Starlink launch completely by chance. The second morning greeted us with an overcast sky and a chill in the air. It felt like the transition from summer to fall had happened overnight. We hiked out to a very different scene than our hike in. Mist was pouring in a marmot basin at a surprising speed and had a very eerie feel. This is sped up a little, but the fog was fast enough to watch come up and envelop everything in just a couple of minutes. On our way down, a solo hiker joined our group. This was his 10th time doing this trip. We made it down to the parking area just as the llamas arrived and had one more surprise waiting for us. Well, I didn't say it was a good one. Mice got into our car while we were gone and got all of our cookies. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. There are hiking resources below and information on free ways to help support this channel. The easiest is liking and subscribing. Thank you. Happy exploring.